Hello students of Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and this is an exam review video covering the topic of particle kinetics. Particle kinetics fundamentally covers Newtonian kinetics, conservation of energy, work and energy, and also impulse and momentum. Now, just a note that every single kinetics problem that you work will require a free body diagram, and actually should add to this, plus a kinetic diagram. Now, a kinetic diagram is basically just focused on motion. So it can either be acceleration-based if you're on a Newtonian problem, or it could be velocity-based if you are working a um, velocity-based problem, which is essentially either energy-based or uh, momentum-based. Okay, so all problems in this entire section. Fundamentally, any problem that has any types of forces, any kind of bodies with weight, is going to need a combined free body diagram and kinetic diagram. Most of the time you can combine them in very complicated cases, which we don't usually get into in particles, you might want to separate them. But we need both free body diagram and kinetic diagram for all kinetics problems. So Newtonian is your classic F equals MA, right? Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration vector. The force is a vector, acceleration is a vector. You can solve any problems, any kinetic problem whatsoever with this equation, but it gets really complicated if you have a kind of multi-phase acceleration. If your acceleration is a function of position and maybe there's a spring involved and changes in height and all these different things can happen, the acceleration can get really, really complicated. So often we reserve this technique for solving for acceleration often on single particle problems with one acceleration phase, which honestly is kind of the easier end of the spectrum. As we get into problems with multiple particles, multiple acceleration phases, then we often will choose either work and energy or impulse and momentum. The main difference between work and energy and impulse momentum is the difference of distance versus over time. Okay, so all energy problems are going to incorporate some kind of change in motion, change in energy over a distance. Impulse momentum problems are going to involve a change in motion over time. Okay, that's also highlighted here in the table. That difference between um, time is, a, is basically incorporated into impulse momentum where displacement is incorporated into conservation or work and energy. Now, the only difference between conservation energy and work and energy, and we'll see that as we move forward, is essentially this guy right here, that there are no external forces in a conservation of energy problem. All right, so looking at these three different techniques specifically, now I've gone ahead and highlighted some of the key points, which I think are, if I could just download information into your brain, um, it would start with these key points, okay? Anytime you see the word kinetics, know that the word kinetics means relating forces to motion. Um, another way you can think of that is every time you see the word kinetics, you need a free body diagram and a kinetics diagram. We express motion in three different coordinate systems, the same we did for particle motion. Remember that coordinate systems are simply tools to solve problems. So you want to select the coordinate system that makes your life the easiest. Basically select the coordinate system fundamentally, which is the same coordinate system that your acceleration is based in or that you can at least solve very quickly for your acceleration and then get all of your force components into the same acceleration system. Now, these forces can exist relative to all three coordinate systems. We talked about that quite, that quite a bit in section 13.6. If you have forces in multiple coordinate systems, first, you can go ahead and solve for your acceleration in relative to uh, whatever the easiest coordinate system is as things are expressed. Then you're going to need to get all your force components into the same coordinate system as your acceleration. Right? Remember that everything here in Newtonian is based off of sum of forces is equal mass times acceleration. So this force vector and this acceleration vector over here on the right have to be in the same components. Okay, if you have forces in T and N, get your acceleration in T and N. If you have acceleration in R and theta, get your forces in R and theta. Okay, match those up. 
So fundamentally, the equations aren't that exciting because we derived all these equations over here on this side of the table, the right side of the table back in chapter 12. And they're simply relating position, velocity, and acceleration, but they're relating them relative to three different axes systems. Now, in section 13.6, which is where we talked about R theta motion, right? Tra um, trans radial and transverse. Radial is R, transverse is theta. Uh, we introduced that there was kind of four different forces, fundamentally, that we would use in these kind of problems. One of those would be the weight force. Weight force is always in the negative uh, y direction. Another force here would be the normal force. Normal force could either be positive or negative normal axis direction really just depending on what the rest of the forces are doing, how fast the particle is moving, um, different interactions, okay? So positive or negative normal. That's always perpendicular to the track, to the path. Then we can also have a pushing force, right? If we have an arm coming out, which is along our radial R axis, and it's pushing that particle along the path, we have a normal force to the arm, right? Perpendicular to R is always either positive or negative theta. If there is friction, friction is going to be um, opposing the velocity. Velocity is in the direction of the tangential axis, therefore friction is in the negative tangential axis direction. Now, one last thing to highlight here is that our theta axes, probably the trickiest axes of all of these to draw, is always in the direction of an increasing theta angle. Okay, so here's my theta angle going from a horizontal reference wrapped up there in a positive right-hand rule direction. Therefore, theta axes is measured over to the left in the direction of an increasing theta angle. If theta went to 85, 90 degrees, that's going to basically be in this direction of theta pushing out here. So once you get all of your axes set, solve for your accelerations, you break your forces into components, solve for your unknowns. Next up, we had work and energy. Now, work and energy is probably the most familiar of the three different kinetic techniques because it's a really common one to be taught in physics, specifically conservation of energy. So I thought that was a good place to start. Um, so as we think about conservation of energy, it is a scalar relationship, okay? Scalar, not vector. Now, there is one directional term in that entire um, conservation of energy relationship, and it is this height h, okay? The height h is always measured above a vertical datum. So positive h above datum. If you are below the datum, it's going to be minus h, below the datum. And of course, it's going to be zero at the datum. Okay, so that's the only directional term. All the rest of these terms will be positive no matter what, because uh, the only really directional terms in here is velocity, which gets squared, and delta, which is the displacement of a spring from neutral, which also gets squared in this equation. All right, so that handles systems where we have only forces between particles or maybe single particles where the exchange is happening between velocity and height and springs and nothing else, right? No other external factors, no friction, no external forces, nothing else is interacting. If anything else is, is interacting, it's not a problem. We just wrap it into this work term, okay? This external non-conservative force work term we call W prime between one and two. Keep in mind that at our initial condition, doesn't matter if you're talking about work and energy or conservation, this is really kind of, you can think of this as pre, right? Pre the distance over which something happens. And then at position two here, this is like post, this is at the end. And this work term is during. All right, so we incorporate all the different work and work fundamentally um, work in the most general sense is a scalar value. It is equal to the product of force and distance. Okay, so work can be positive, work can be negative if our force is opposing the displacement. Um, friction is a classic negative work term. The last topic we talked about in this chapter is power and efficiency. 
Um, power is also, it's actually very similarly related to work in that it's a dot product, but power here is the dot product of force, the instantaneous force vector, and the instantaneous velocity vector. So if you're asked to use power, or maybe the problem gives you a power input, and you need to solve for one of these other terms, realize it just comes from the dot product. And so if the force is 100% in the direction of the velocity, you just multiply them. If there's a component in the direction of the velocity, then you need to take either the dot product or you could take, say, a, a cosine of the angle between them but figure out how much of the force is in the direction of the velocity. And then efficiency is simply a measurement of output to input, right? Energy or power output over input. And of course, we never can have an efficiency above one. That would mean that we're actually producing power or producing energy, um, which is fundamentally impossible given all the current technology we have. All right, then we got into the last chapter here. Um, let me quick little edit here. This is chapter 15, not 14, impulse and momentum. So impulse and momentum is like a hybrid of Newtonian kinetics and also work and energy. Okay, it has the similarities to Newtonian kinetics that it's a vector-based relationship, but then it has the similarities to work and energy that you're basically swapping um, in, in impulse and momentum, you're swapping momentum for impulse versus swapping energy for work. Okay, so it has a very similar structure. Now keep in mind that there is only one momentum term dealing with velocity, right? This guy right here. So being that there's only a, a momentum term based upon velocity, everything else, including gravitational weight, including friction forces, including spring forces, including external forces, all that stuff has to get lumped into impulse. And keep in mind that impulse is the product of force and time, not forces alone, but basically force times time. If the force is a function of time, we can integrate over the time interval dt. And because this is a vector relationship, we can, again, similar to Newtonian, split this into a two-dimensional problem, an x version and a y version. Okay, so that's the, the general idea of linear impulse and momentum. Now, if there's no impulse, or if there's conservative impulse, basically conservative impulse being conservative forces acting between particles in a constrained motion system, uh, this would classically be like the tension in a cable that attached two masses together, maybe in a pulley system or something else. But an equal tension pulling on both bodies essentially means you're going to get a, a negative impulse, positive and negative impulses, which will cancel to zero. Um, between those bodies. But then we can just take a look at conserving the momentum in the system. Now, a special case of conservation of momentum, which we spend most of our time on, is impact. And so if you have one dimensional impact with a single ball, kind of like a ball bouncing off a surface, the only equation you're going to need is your coefficient of restitution equation. Okay, the coefficient of restitution always applies essentially perpendicular to the surface that you're bouncing a ball off of. And so if you have one particle, you are just really decreasing the bounce velocity of that ball, like the bounce a ball off the floor. Um, the bounce velocity coming off the floor is going to equal the coefficient of restitution, which is an interaction term between the ball and the floor times the original velocity. And then you just flip the sign, right? Because when you bounce something off a wall or a surface, you're going to have it bouncing back in the opposite direction. If you pick up a second ball, even in one dimensional motion, you're going to need an additional equation, which is the conservation of system momentum. Okay, and so that would be, like if we look at this diagram right here, if we bounce a ball with no T components whatsoever, everything here in the N, we would need basically both of these equations, conserving momentum between the balls in the system, and then also applying the coefficient of restitution. Finally, if you have basically two-dimensional impact, we often call this oblique impact, then you need to add a third equation. And in this third equation, what we're doing is we're splitting the velocity components into a T component, which is basically along the surface 
of contact um, and then an end component. Nothing changes in the T direction. All momentum per ball is conserved. And typically if the mass of the ball doesn't change, that really means that your velocities here in the T direction are conserved, which is what these equations here are referring to. But then in this end direction, you find the end components and then you apply these two equations to resolve what's going on in the end direction. Okay, so this can be up to a three equation, three unknown set when you have oblique impact, two dimensional impact with two particles. Then the last topic that could be on this exam is angular momentum. It's the first kind of true angular term or angular section that we've had in this entire first half of dynamics. And it's a good transition because the second half of dynamics has all sorts of angular stuff going on, all sorts of cross products. And so angular momentum is basically your R cross linear momentum, right? Linear momentum we know is this MV. And so if our angular term is R cross, that's going to be R cross MV. And then additionally, our angular impulse really is R cross, you could write this out as R cross the integral of the, I'll put my summation out front here, of my forces dt. Right, but I'm going to R cross each and every force in the system, which means I need to include R cross F forces which basically produce moments as well as couple moments okay so don't forget to include both couple moments and also r cross f moments as impulse but again it's really just that moment whether it's a couple or r cross f times time if it's a constant value if it does vary with time then you might need to integrate uh, do that integral of the sum of your moments dt and so again, this can apply for either single particles. It could also apply for multiple particles, adding these summations here out front, just emphasizing that if you have, once again, a constrained motion system, in a constrained motion, you can ignore the impulse of the conservative forces between particles, right? Cable tensions between them or touching forces between particles, um, and then still include any kind of external impulses which are adding to or subtracting from the angular momentum of the system. So that covers all the topics in particle kinetics. I hope that that uh, review was useful to you. I encourage you to work as many problems as possible across these areas, ideally selecting problems that you don't know exactly what section they came from. Give yourself a time limited window to work on that problem. Um, ideally have a solution available so that you can take a look at the solution if you do get stuck, but don't get stuck for hours on a single problem. Move through as many problems as possible so that you can get fluent in all these different areas and get very good at selecting a across the different tools, across the different kinetics tools uh, between Newtonian, the work and energy related techniques, and also impulse and momentum. Hope you're having a great day.